Requiem by Edmund Hamilton. Kellen thought sourly that he wasn't commanding a starship. He was running a traveling circus. He had aboard Talaudio men with tons of equipment, pontifical commentators who knew the answer to anything, beautiful females who were experts on the woman's angle, pompous bureaucrats after publicity, and entertainment stars who had come along for the same reason. He had had a good ship and crew, one of the best in the survey. Had had, they weren't anymore. They had been taken off their proper job of pushing astrographical knowledge ever further into the remote regions of the galaxy and had been sent off with this cargo of costly people on a totally unnecessary mission. He said bitterly to himself, damn all sentimentalists. He said aloud, does its position check with your calculated orbit, Mr. Riney? Riney II, a young and serious man who had been fussing with instruments in the astrogation room, came out and said, yes, right on the nose. Shall we go in and land now? Kellen didn't answer for a moment, standing there in the front of the bridge, a middle-aged man, stocky, square-shouldered, and with his tanned, plain face showing none of the resentment he felt. He hated to give the order, but he had to. All right, take her in. He looked gloomily through the filter windows as they went in. In this fringe spiral of the galaxy, stars were relatively infrequent, and there were only ragged drifts of them across the darkness. Full ahead shone a small, compact sun like a diamond. It was a white dwarf and had been so for 2,000 years, giving forth so little warmth that the planets which circled it had been frozen and ice-locked all that time. They still were, all except the innermost world. Kellen stared at that planet, a tawny blob. The ice that had sheathed it ever since its primary collapsed into a white dwarf had now melted. Months before, a dark wandering body had passed very close to this lifeless system. Its passing had perturbed the planetary orbits and the inner planets had started to spiral slowly in toward their sun and the ice had begun to go. Virason, one of the junior officers, came into the bridge looking harassed. He said to Kellen, they want to see you down below, sir, especially Mr. Borodale. He says it's urgent. Kellen thought wearily, well, I might as well go down and face the pack of them. Here's where they really begin. He nodded to Virason and went down below to the main cabin. The sight of it revolted him. Instead of his own men in it, relaxing or chinning, it held a small and noisy mob of overdressed, overloud men and women, all of whom seemed to be talking at once and uttering brittle, nervous laughter. Captain Kellen, I want to ask you, Captain, if you please. He patiently nodded and smiled and plowed through them to Borodell. He had been given particular instructions to cooperate with Borodell, the most famous Telaudio commentator in the Federation. Borodell was a slightly plump man with a round pink face and incongruously large and solemn black eyes. When he spoke, one recognized at once that deep, incredibly rich and meaningful voice. My first broadcast is set for 30 minutes from now, Captain. I shall one of you as we go in. If my men could take a mobile up to the bridge. Kellen nodded. Of course, Mr. Verison is up there and will assist them in any way. Thank you, Captain. Would you like to see the broadcast? I would, yes, but... He was interrupted by Lori Lee, whose glitteringly handsome face and figure and sophisticated drawl made her the idol of all female Telodio reporters. My broadcast is to be right after landing, remember? I'd like to do it alone, with just the emptiness of that world as background. Can you keep the others from spoiling the effect, please? We'll do what we can, Kellen mumbled. And as the rest of the pack converged on him, he added hastily, I'll talk to you later. Mr. Boredale's broadcast, he got through them, following after Boredale toward the cabin that had been set up as a Telodio transmitter room. It had, Kellen thought bitterly, once served an honest purpose, holding the racks of soil and water and other samples from far worlds. But that had been when they were doing an honest survey job, not chaperoning chattering fools on this sentimental pilgrimage. The broadcasting setup was beyond Kellen. He didn't want to hear this, but it was better than the mob in the main cabin. He watched as Borodale made a signal. The monitor screen came alive. It showed a dun-colored globe spinning in space, growing visibly larger as they swept toward it. Now straggling seas were identifiable upon it. Moments passed and Borodale did not speak, 
just letting that picture go out. Then his deep voice spoke over the picture with dramatic simplicity. You are looking at the earth, he said. Silence again, and the spinning brownish ball was bigger now with white clouds ragged upon it. And then Borrowdale spoke again. You who watch from many worlds in the galaxy, this is the homeland of our race. Speak its name to yourselves, the earth. Kellen felt a deepening distaste. This was all true, but still it was phony. What was earth now to him or to Borodale or his billions of listeners? But it was a story, a sentimental occasion. So they had to pump it up into something big. Some 3,500 years ago, Borodale was saying, our ancestors lived on this world alone. That was when they first went into space, to these other planets first, but very soon to other stars. And so our Federation began, our community of human civilization on many stars and worlds. Now in the monitor, the view of Earth's dun globe had been replaced by the face of Borodale in close-up. He paused dramatically. Then, over 2,000 years ago, it was discovered that the sun of Earth was about to collapse into a white dwarf. So those people who still remained on Earth left it forever. And when the solar change came, it and the other planets became mantled in eternal ice. And now, within months, the final end of the old planet of our origin is at hand. It is slowly spiraling toward the sun, and soon it will plunge into it as Mercury and Venus have already done. And when that occurs, the world of man's origin will be gone forever. Again, the pause for just the right length of time. And then Borodal continued in a voice expertly pitched in a lower key. We on this ship, we humble reporters and servants of the vast Talaudio audience on all the worlds, have come here so that in these next weeks, we can give you this last look at our ancestral world. We think, we hope, that you'll find interest in recalling a past that is almost legend. And Kellen thought, the bastard has no more interest in this old planet than I have, but he surely is smooth. As soon as the broadcast ended, Kellen found himself besieged once more by the clamoring crowd in the main cabin. He held up his hand in protest. Please, now, now we have a landing to make first. Will you come with me, Dr. Darno? Darno was from Historical Bureau and was the titular head of the whole expedition, although no one paid him much attention. He was a sparrowy, elderly man who babbled excitedly as he went with Kellen to the bridge. He at least was sincere in his interest, Kellen thought. For that matter, so were all the dozen-odd scientists who were aboard. But they were far outnumbered by the fat cats and big brass out for publicity, the professional enthusers, and sentimentalists. A real hell of a job the survey had given him. In the bridge, he glanced through the window at the dun-colored planet and its satellite. Then he asked Darno, You said something about a particular place where you wanted to land. The historiographer bobbed his head and began unfolding a big, old-fashioned chart. See this continent here? Along its eastern coast were a lot of the biggest cities, like New York. Kellen remembered that name. He'd learned it in school history a long time ago. Darno's finger stabbed the chart. If you could land there, right on the island, Kellen studied the relief features, then shook his head. Too low. There'll be great tides as time goes on, and we can't take chances. That higher ground back inland a bit should be all right, though. Darno looked disappointed. Well, I suppose you're right, Kellen told Riney to set up the landing pattern. Then he asked Darno skeptically, You surely don't expect to find much in those old cities now. Not after they've had all that ice on them for 2,000 years. They'll be badly damaged, of course, Darno admitted, but there should be a vast number of relics. I could study here for years. We haven't got years. We've got only a few months before this planet gets too close to the sun, said Kellen, and he added mentally, Thank God. The ship went into its landing pattern. Atmosphere whined outside its hull, and then thick gray clouds boiled and raced around it. It went down through the cloud layer and moved above a dull brown landscape that had flecks of white in its deeper valleys. Far ahead there was the glint of a gray ocean, but the ship came down toward a rolling brown plain and settled there. And then there was the expected thunderclap of silence that always followed the shutting off of all machinery. Kellen looked at Riney, who turned in a moment from the test panel with a slight surprise on his face. Pressure, oxygen, humidity, everything, all optimum. And then he said, but of course, 
This place was optimum. Kellen nodded. He said, Dr. Darno and I will have a lookout first. Virason, you keep our passengers in. When he and Darno went to the lower airlock, he heard a buzzing clamor from the main cabin, and he judged that Virason was having his hands full. The people in there were not used to being said no to, and he could imagine their resentment. Cold, damp air struck a chill in Kellen when they stepped down out of the airlock. They stood on muddy, gravelly ground that squashed a little under their boots as they trudged away from the ship. They stopped and looked around, shivering. Under the low, gray, cloudy sky, there stretched a sad, sunless brown landscape. Nothing broke the drab color of raw soil except the shards of ice still lingering in low places. A heavy, desultory wind stirred the raw air and then was still. There was not a sound except the clink-clinking of the ship's skin, cooling and contracting, behind them. Kellen thought that no amount of sentimentality could make this anything but a dreary world. But Darno's eyes were shining. We'll have to make every minute of the time count, he muttered. Every minute. Within two hours, the heavy broadcast equipment was being trundled away from the ship on two motor tracks that headed eastward. On one of the tracks rode Lori Lee, resplendent in lilac-colored costume of synthesilk. Kellen, worried about the possibility of quicksands, went along for that first broadcast from the cliffs that looked down on the ruins of New York. He wished he hadn't when it got underway. For Lori Lee, her blonde head bright even in the dull light, turned loose all her practiced charming gestures for the broadcast cameras, as she gestured with pretty excitement down toward the ruins. It's so unbelievable, she cried to a thousand worlds. To be here on Earth, to see the old places again, it does something to you. It did something to Kellen. It made him feel sick at his stomach. He turned and went back to the ship, feeling at that moment that if Lori Lee went into a quicksand on the way back, it would be no great loss. But that first day was only the beginning. The big ship quickly became the center of multifarious and continuous broadcasts. It had been especially equipped to beam strongly to the nearest station in the Federation network, and its transmitters were seldom quiet. Kellen found that Darno, who was supposed to coordinate all this programming, was completely useless. The little historian was living in a seventh heaven on this old planet, which had been uncovered to view for the first time in millennia, and he was away most of the time on field trips of his own. It fell to his assistant, an earnest and worried and harassed young man, to try to reconcile the clashing claims and demands of the highly temperamental broadcasting stars. Kellen felt an increasing boredom at having to stand around while all this tosh went out over the ether. These people were having a field day, but he didn't think much of them and of their broadcasts. Roy Quayle, the young male fashion designer, put on a semi-humorous, semi-nostalgic display of the old earth fashions, with the prettier girls wearing some of the ridiculous old costumes he had had duplicated. Barden, the famous teleplay producer, ran off ancient films of the old Earth dramas that had everyone in stitches. Jay Maxson, a rising politician in Federation Congress, discussed with Borodale the governmental systems of the old days in a way calculated to give his own wide galaxy party none the worst of it. The Arcturus players, that brilliant group of young stage folk, did readings of old Earth dramas and poems. It was, Kellen thought disgustedly, just playing. Grown people, famous people, seizing the opportunity given by the accidental end of a forgotten planet to posture in the spotlight like smart aleck children. There was real work to do in the galaxy, the work of the survey, the endless and wearying but always fascinating job of charting the wild systems and worlds. And instead of doing that job, he was condemned to spend weeks and months here with these phonies, the scientists and historians he respected. They did few broadcasts and they did not fake their interest. It was one of them, Haller, the biologist, who excitedly showed Kellen a handful of damp soil a week after their arrival. Look at that, he said proudly. Kellen stared. What? Those seeds, they're common weedgrass seeds. Look at them. Kellen looked, and now he saw that from each of the tiny seeds projected a new-looking hair-like tendril. They're sprouting? He said unbelievingly. Haller nodded happily. I was hoping for it. You see, it was almost spring in the Northern Hemisphere, according to the records, when Saul collapsed suddenly into a white dwarf. Within hours, the temperature plunged, and the hydrosphere and atmosphere began to freeze. 
but surely that would kill all plant life. No, said Haller. The larger plants, trees, perennial shrubs, and so on, yes. But the seeds of the smaller annuals just froze into suspended animation. Now the warmth that melted them is causing germination. Then we'll have grass, small plants. Very soon, the way the warmth is increasing, it was indeed getting a little warmer all the time as these first weeks went by. The clouds lifted one day and there was brilliant, thin white sunshine from the little diamond sun. And there came a morning when they found the rolling landscape flushed with a pale tint of green. Grass grew, weeds grew, vines grew, all of them seeming to rush their growth as though they knew that this, their last season, would not be long. Soon the raw brown mud of the hills and valleys had been replaced by a green carpet, and everywhere taller growths were shooting up and flowers beginning to appear. Hepaticas, bluebells, dandelions, violets bloomed once more. Kellen took a long walk now that he did not have to plow through mud. The chattering people around the ship, the constant tug and pull of clashing temperaments, the brittle, febrile voices got him down. He felt better to get away by himself. The grass and the flowers had come back, but otherwise this was still an empty world. Yet there was a certain peace of mind in tramping up and down the long green rolling slopes. The sun was bright and cheerful now, and white clouds dotted the sky, and the warm wind whispered as he sat upon a ridge and looked away westward where nobody was or would ever be again. Damn dull, he thought, but at least it's better than back with the gabblers. He sat for a long time in the slanting sunshine, feeling his bristling nerves relax. The grass stirred about him, rippling in long waves, and the taller flowers nodded. No other movement, no other life. A pity, he thought, that there were no birds for this last spring of the old planet, not even a butterfly. Well, it made no difference. All this wouldn't last long. As Kellen tramped back through the deepening dusk, he suddenly became aware of a shining bubble in the darkening sky. He stopped and stared up at it, and then remembered. Of course it was the old planet's moon. During the cloudy nights, he had forgotten all about it. He went on with its vague light about him. When he stepped back into the lighted main cabin of the ship, he was abruptly jarred out of his relaxed mood. A first-class squabble was going on, and everybody was either contributing to it or commenting on it. Lori Lee, looking like a pretty child complaining of a hurt, was maintaining that she should have broadcast time next day for her special woman's interest feature, and somebody else disputed her claim. And young Valerie, Darno's assistant, looked harried and upset. Kellen got by them without being noticed, locked the door of his cabin and poured himself a long drink and damned survey all over again for this assignment. He took good care to get out of the ship early in the morning before the storm of temperament blew up again. He left Verison in charge of the ship, there being nothing for any of them to do now anyway, and legged it away over the green slopes before anyone could call him back. They had five more weeks of this, Kellen thought. Then thank God Earth would be getting so near the sun that they must take the ship back into its proper element of space. Until that wished-for day arrived, he would stay out of sight as much as possible. He walked miles each day. He stayed carefully away from the east in the ruins of old New York, where the others so often were but he went north and west and south over the grassy, flowering slopes of the empty world. At least it was peaceful, even though there was nothing at all to see. But after a while, Kellen found that there were things to see if you looked for them. There was the way the sky changed, never seeming to look the same twice. Sometimes it was deep blue and white clouds sailed it like mighty ships. And then it would suddenly turn gray and miserable and rain would drizzle on him to be ended when a lance of sunlight shot through the clouds and slashed them to flying ribbons. And there was a time when upon a ridge he watched vast thunderheads boil up and darken in the west, and Black Storm marched across the land like an army with banners of lightning and drums of thunder. The winds and the sunshine, the sweetness of the air, and the look of the moonlight, and the feel of the yielding grass under his feet all seemed oddly right. Kellen had walked on many worlds under the glare of many-colored suns, and some of them he had liked much better than this one, and some of them he had not liked at all. But never had he found a world that seemed so exactly attuned to his body as this outworn, empty planet. He wondered vaguely what it had been like when there were trees and birds, 
and animals of many kinds in roads and cities. He borrowed film books from the reference library Darno and the others had brought and looked at them in his cabin of nights. He did not really care very much, but at least it kept him out of the broils and quarrels, and it had a certain interest. Thereafter, in his wandering strolls, Kellen tried to see the place as it would have been in the long ago. There would have been robins and bluebirds, and yellow and black bumblebees nosing the flowers, and tall trees with names that were equally strange to him, elms and willows and sycamores, and small furred animals, and humming clouds of insects and fish and frogs in the pools and streams, a whole vast complex symphony of life, long gone, long forgotten. But were all the men and women and children who had lived here less forgotten? Borodale and the others talked much on their broadcasts about the people of Old Earth, but that was just a faceless name, a term that meant nothing. Not one of those millions surely had ever thought of himself as part of a numberless multitude. Each one had been to himself and to those close to him or her, an individual, unique and never to be exactly repeated. And what did the glib talkers know of all those individuals? What could anyone know? Kellen found traces of them here and there, bits of flotsam that even the crush of the ice had spared. A twisted piece of steel, a girder or rail that someone had labored to make. A quarry with the tool marks still on the rocks, where surely men had once sweated in the sun. The broken shards of concrete that stretched away in a ragged line to make a road upon which men and women had once traveled, hurrying upon missions of love or ambition, greed or fear. He found more than that, a startling find that he made by purest chance. He followed a brook that ran down a very narrow valley, and at one point he leapt across it, and as he landed, he looked up and saw that there was a house. Kellen thought at first that it was miraculously preserved whole and unbroken, and surely that could not be. But when he went closer, he saw that this was only illusion, and that destruction had been at work upon it too. Still, it remained incredibly a recognizable house. It was a rambling stone cottage with low walls and a slate roof set close against the steep green wall of the valley. One gable end was smashed in and part of that end wall. Studying the way it was embayed in the wall, Kellen decided that a chance natural arch of ice must have preserved it from the grinding pressure that had shattered almost all other structures. The windows and doors were only gaping openings. He went inside and looked around the cold shadows of what had once been a room. There were some wrecked pieces of rotting furniture, and dried mud banked along one wall contained unrecognizable bits of rusted junk. But there was not much else. It was chill and oppressive in there, and he went out and sat on the little terrace in the sunshine. He looked at the house. It could have been built no later than the 20th century, he thought. A good many different people must have lived in it during the hundreds of years before the evacuation of Earth. Kellen thought that it was strange that the air photo surveys that Darnow's men had made in quest of relics had not discovered the place. But then it was not so strange. The stone walls were so grayly inconspicuous, and it was set so deeply into the sheltering bay of the valley wall. His eye fell on eroded lettering on the cement side of the terrace, and he went and brushed the soil off that place. The words were time-eaten and faint, but he could read them. Ross and Jenny, their house. Kellen smiled. Well, at least he knew now who once had lived here, who probably had built the place. He could imagine two young people happily scratching the words in the wet cement, exuberant with achievement. And who had Ross and Jenny been, and where were they now? He walked around the place. To his surprise, there was a ragged flower garden at one side. A half dozen kinds of brilliant little flowers, unlike the wild ones of the slopes, grew in patchy disorder here. Seeds of an old garden had been ready to germinate when the long winter of earth came down and had slept in suspended animation until the ice melted and the warm blooming time came at last. He did not know what kinds of flowers these were, but there was a brave jauntiness about them that he liked. Starting back across the green land in the soft twilight, Kellen thought that he should tell Darno about the place. But if he did, the gabbling pack in the ship would certainly stampede toward it. He could imagine the solemn and cute and precious broadcasts that Boredale and the Lee woman and rest of them would stage from the old house. No, he thought, the devil with them. He didn't care anything himself about the old house. 
It was just that it was a refuge of quiet he had found, and he didn't want to draw to it the noisy horde he was trying to escape. Kellen was glad in the following days that he had not told. The house gave him a place to go to, to poke around and investigate, a focus for his interest in this waiting time. He spent hours there and never told anyone at all. Haller, the biologist, lent him a book on the flowers of Earth, and he brought it with him and used it to identify those in the ragged garden. Verbenas, pinks, morning glories, and the bold red and yellow ones called nasturtiums. Many of these, he read, did not do well on other worlds and had never been successfully transplanted. If that was so, this would be their last blooming anywhere at all. He rooted around the interior of the house trying to figure out how people had lived in it. It was strange, not at all like a modern metalloy house. Even the interior walls were thick beyond belief and the windows seemed small and pokey. The biggest room was obviously where they had lived most, and its window openings looked out on the little garden and the green valley and brook beyond. Kellen wondered what they had been like, the Ross and Jenny who had once sat here together and looked out these windows. What things had been important to them? What had hurt them? What had made them laugh? He himself had never married. The far-ranging captains of the survey seldom did. But he wondered about this marriage of long ago and what had come of it. Had they had children, did their blood still run on the far worlds? But even if it did, what was that now to those two of long ago? There had been a poem about flowers at the end of the old book on flowers Holler had lent him, and he remembered some of it. All are at one now, roses and lovers, not known of the winds and the fields and the sea, not a breath of the time that has been hovers in the air, now soft with a summer to be. Well, yes, Kellen thought. They were all at one now, the Rosses and the Jennies, and the things they had done, and the things they had thought, all at one now in the dust of this old planet, whose fiery final summer would be soon, very soon. Physically, everything that had been done, everyone who had lived on Earth, was still here in its atoms, accepting the tiny fraction of its matter that had sped to other worlds. He thought of the names that were so famous still through all the galactic worlds, names of men and women in places. Shakespeare, Plato, Beethoven, Blake, the old splendor of Babylon and the bones of Angkor and the humble houses of his own ancestors, all here, all still here. Kellen mentally shook himself. He didn't have enough to do, that was his trouble, to be brooding here on such shadowy things. He had seen all there was to this queer little old place and there was no use in coming back to it but he came back. It was not, he told himself, as though he had any sentimental antiquarian interest in this old place. He had heard enough of that kind of gush from all the glittering phonies in the ship. He was a survey man, and all he wanted was to get back to his job. But while he was stuck here, it was better to be roaming the green land or poking about this old relic than to have to listen to the endless babbling and quarreling of those others. They were quarreling more and more because they were tired of it here. It had seemed to them a fine thing to posture upon a galactic stage by helping to cover the end of Earth. But time dragged by and their flush of synthetic enthusiasm wore thin. They could not leave. The expedition must broadcast the final climax of the planet's end. But that was still weeks away. Darno and his scholars and scientists, busy coming and going to many old sites, could have stayed here forever, but the others were frankly bored. But Kellen found in the old house enough interest to keep the waiting from being too oppressive. He had read a good bit now about the way things had been here in the old days, and he sat long hours on the little terrace in the afternoon sunshine, trying to imagine what it had been like when the man and woman named Ross and Jenny had lived here. So strange, so circumscribed, that old life seemed now. Most people had had ground cars in those days, he had read, and had gone back and forth in them to the cities where they worked. Did both the man and woman go, or just the man? Did the woman stay in the house, perhaps with their children if they had any? And in the afternoons, did she do things in the little flower garden where a few bright, ragged survivors still bloomed? Did they ever dream that some future day when they were long gone, their house would lie empty and silent with no visitor except a stranger from far off stars? He remembered a line in one of the old plays the Arcturus players had read, Come Like Shadows so depart. No, Kellen thought. Ross and Jenny were shadows now, but they had not been then. 
to them and to all the other people he could visualize going and coming busily about the earth in those days. It was he, the future, the man yet to come, who was the shadow. Alone here, sitting and trying to imagine the long ago, Kellen had an eerie feeling sometimes that his vivid imaginings of people in crowded cities and movement and laughter were the reality and that he himself was only a watching wraith. Summer days came swiftly, hot and hotter. Now the white sun was larger in the heavens and pouring down such light and heat as Earth had not received for millennia, and all the green life across it seemed to respond with an exultant surge of final growth, an act of joyous affirmation that Kellen found infinitely touching. Now even the nights were warm and the winds blew thrilling soft, and on the distant beaches the ocean leaped up in a laughter of spray and thunder, running in great solar tides. With a shock as though awakened from dreaming, Kellen suddenly realized that only a few days were left. The spiral was closing in fast now, and very quickly the heat would mount beyond all tolerance. He would, he told himself, be very glad to leave. There would be the wait in space until it was all over, and then he could go back to his own work, his own life, and stop fussing over shadows because there was nothing else to do. Yes, he would be glad. Then when only a few days were left, Kellen walked out again to the old house and was musing over it when a voice spoke behind him. Perfect, said Bordell's voice. A perfect relic. Kellen turned, feeling somehow startled and dismayed. Bordell's eyes were alight with interest as he surveyed the house, and then he turned to Kellen. I was walking when I saw you, Captain, and thought I'd catch up to you. Is this where you've been going so often? Kellen a little guiltily evaded. I've been here a few times. But why in the world didn't you tell us about this? exclaimed Borodale. Why, we can do a terrific final broadcast from here, a typical ancient home of Earth. Roy can put some of the players in the old costumes and we'll show them living here the way people did. Unexpectedly to himself, a violent reaction came up in Kellen. He said roughly, no. Borodale arched his eyebrows, no, but why not? Why not indeed? What difference could it possibly make to him if they swarmed all over the old house, laughing at its ancientness and its inadequacies, posing, grinning for the cameras in front of it, prancing about in old-fashioned costumes and making a show of it? What could that mean to him, who cared nothing about this forgotten planet or anything on it? And yet something in him revolted at what they would do here. And he said, We might have to take off very suddenly now, having you all out here away from the ship, could involve a dangerous delay. You said yourself we wouldn't take off for a few days yet, exclaimed Borodal, and he added firmly, I don't know why you should want to obstruct us, Captain, but I can go over your head to higher authority. He went away and Kellen thought unhappily. He'll message back to survey headquarters and I'll get my ears burned off and why the devil did I do it anyway? I must be getting real planet happy. He went and sat down on the terrace and watched until the sunset deepened into dusk. The moon came up white and brilliant, but the air was not quiet tonight. A hot, dry wind had begun to blow, and the stir of the tall grass made the slopes and plains seem vaguely alive. It was as though a queer pulse had come into the air and the ground, as the sun called its child homeward, and earth strained to answer. The house dreamed in the silver light, and the flowers in the garden rustled. Borodale came back, a dark, pudgy figure in the moonlight. He said triumphantly, I got through to your headquarters. They've ordered your full cooperation. We'll want to make our first broadcast here tomorrow. Kellen stood up. No, you can't ignore an order. We won't be here tomorrow, said Kellen. It is my responsibility to get the ship off Earth in ample time for safety. We take off in the morning. Borodale was silent for a moment, and when he spoke, his voice had a puzzled quality. You're advancing things just to block our broadcast, of course. I just can't understand your attitude. Well, Kellen thought, he couldn't quite understand it himself, so how could he explain it? He remained silent, and Borodale looked at him and then at the old house. Yet maybe I do understand, Borodale said thoughtfully after a moment. You've come here often by yourself. A man can get too friendly with ghosts, Kellen said roughly. Don't talk nonsense. We'd better get back to the ship. There's plenty to do before takeoff. Borodale did not speak as they went back out of the moonlit valley. He looked back once, but Kellen did not look back. 
They took the ship off 12 hours later, in a morning made dull and ominous by racing clouds. Kellen felt a sharp relief when they cleared atmosphere and were out in the depthless, starry blackness. He knew where he was in space. It was the place where a spaceman belonged. He'd get a stiff reprimand for this later, but he was not sorry. They put the ship into a calculated orbit and waited. Days, many of them, must pass before the end came to Earth. It seemed quite near the white sun now, and its moon had slid away from it on a new distorted orbit. But even so, it would be a while before they could broadcast to a watching galaxy the end of its ancestral world. Kellen stayed much of that time in his cabin. The gush that was going out over the broadcast now, as the grand finale approached, made him sick. He wished the whole thing was over. It was, he told himself, getting to be a bore. An hour and 20 minutes to E-time, and he supposed he must go up to the bridge and watch it. The mobile camera had been set up there, and Borodale and as many others of them as could crowd in were there. Borodale had been given the last hour's broadcast, and it seemed that the others resented this. Why must you have the whole last hour? Lori Lee was saying bitterly to Borodale. It's not fair, Quayle nodded angrily. There'll be the biggest audience in history, and we should all have a chance to speak. Borodale answered them, and the voices rose and bickered, and Kellen saw the broadcast technicians looking worried. Beyond them, through the filter window, he could see the dark dot of the planet closing on the white star. The sun called, and it seemed that with quickened eagerness, Earth moved on the last steps of its long road. And the clamoring, bickering voices in his ears suddenly brought rage to Kellen. Listen, he said to the broadcast men. Shut off all sound transmission. You can keep the picture on, but no sound. That shocked them all into silence. The Lee woman finally protested, Captain Kellen, you can't. I'm in full command when in space, and I can and do, he said. But the broadcast, the commentary, Kellen said wearily, oh, for Christ's sake, all of you shut up and let the planet die in peace. He turned his back on them. He did not hear their resentful voices, did not even hear when they fell silent and watched through the dark filter windows as he was watching as the camera and the galaxy was watching. And what was there to see but a dark dot almost engulfed in the shining veils of the sun? He thought that already the stones of the old house must be beginning to vaporize. And now the veils of light and fire almost concealed the little planet as the star gathered in its own. All the atoms of old earth, Kellen thought, in this moment bursting free to mingle with the solar being, all that had been Ross and Jenny, all that had been Shakespeare and Schubert, Gay flowers and running streams, oceans and rocks and the wind of the air, received into the brightness that had given them life. They watched in silence, but there was nothing more to see, nothing at all. Silently, the camera was turned off. Kellen gave an order, and presently the ship was pulling out of orbit, starting on the long voyage back. By that time, the others had gone, all but Borodale. He said to Borodale without turning, now go ahead and send your complaint to headquarters. Borodell shook his head. Silence can be the best requiem of all. There'll be no complaint. I'm glad now, Captain. Glad? Yes, said Borodell. I'm glad that Earth had one true mourner at the last. 